Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Native communities in southeastern Canada and northern New York State warred amongst themselves long before the arrival of Europeans on the continent. By the early 17th century, however, new alliances were formed and the Iroquois became mortal enemies of the French. The French attempted to form better relations and alliances with the local First Nations tribes, including Wendat Hurons, Algonquins, and Montagnais, who lived in the area of the St. Lawrence River. These tribes sought help in their war against the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, League, or Five Nations. King Louis XIV of France deployed the Régiment Carignan-Salière to combat the Iroquois threat. The Old Regime in Canada, the Colony and the King, 1661-1665, Royal Intervention. Before the 1665 season was over, about 2,000 persons had landed at Quebec at the Royal Charge. At length, writes Mother Juchereau, our joy was completed by the arrival of two vessels with Monsieur de Courcelles, our governor, Monsieur Talon, our intendant, and the last companies of the regiment of Carignan. More state and splendor, more young nobles, more guards and valets, for Courcelles, too, had a superb train, and Monsieur Talon, who naturally loves glory, forgot nothing which could do honor to the king. Thus a sunbeam from the court fell for a moment on the rock of Quebec, yet all was not sunshine, for the voyage had been a tedious one, and disease had broken out in the ships. That which bore Talon had been a hundred and seventeen days at sea, and others were hardly more fortunate. The hospital was crowded with the sick, so too were the church and the neighboring houses, and the nuns were so spent with their labors that seven of them were brought to the point of death. The priests were busied in converting the Huguenots, a number of whom were detected among the soldiers and emigrants. One of them proved refractory, declaring with oaths that he would never renounce his faith. Falling dangerously ill, he was carried to the hospital, where Mother Catherine de St. Augustin bethought her of a plan of conversion, she ground to a powder a small piece of a bone of Father Brebeuf, the Jesuit martyr, and secretly mixed the sacred dust with the patient's gruel, whereupon, says Mother Juchereau, this intractable man forthwith became gentle as an angel, begged to be instructed, embraced the faith, and abjured his errors publicly with an admirable fervor. Two or three years before, the Church of Quebec had received as a gift from the Pope the bodies or bones of two saints, St. Flavian and St. Felicite. They were enclosed in four large coffers or reliquaries, and a grand procession was now ordered in their honour. Tracy, Courcel, Talon, and the agent of the company bore the canopy of the host. Then came the four coffers on four decorated litters, carried by the principal ecclesiastics. Laval followed in pontificals. Forty-seven priests and a long file of officers, nobles, soldiers, and inhabitants followed the precious relics amid the sound of music and the roar of cannon. It is a ravishing thing, says Mother Mary, to see how marvelously exact is Monsieur de Tracy at all these holy ceremonies, where he is always the first to come, for he would not lose a single moment of them. He has been seen in church for six hours together, without once going out. But while the lieutenant general thus edified the colony, he betrayed no lack of qualities equally needful in his position. In Canada, as in the West Indies, he showed both vigor and conduct. First of all, he had been ordered to subdue or destroy the Iroquois, and the regiment of Carignan Salieres was the weapon placed in his hands for this end. Four companies of this corps had arrived early in the season. Four more came with Tracy, more yet with Salieres, their colonel, and now the number was complete. 
as with slouched hat and plume, bandolier and shouldered firelock, these bronzed veterans of the Turkish wars marched at the tap of drum through the narrow street, or mounted the rugged way that led up to the fort, the inhabitants gazed with a sense of profound relief. Tame Indians from the neighboring missions, wild Indians from the woods, stared in silent wonder at their new defenders. Their numbers, their discipline, their uniform, and their martial bearing filled the beholders with admiration. Carignan Salieres was the first regiment of regular troops ever sent to America by the French government. It was raised in Savoy by the Prince of Carignan in 1644, but was soon employed in the service of France, where in 1662 it took a conspicuous part on the side of the king in the battle with Condé and the Fronde at the Porte Saint-Antoine. After the Peace of the Pyrenees, the Prince of Carignan, unable to support the regiment, gave it to the king, and it was, for the first time, incorporated into the French armies. In 1664 it distinguished itself as part of the Allied force of France in the Austrian war against the Turks. In the next year it was ordered to America, along with the fragment of a regiment formed of Germans, the whole being placed under the command of Colonel de Salieres, hence its double name. Fifteen heretics were discovered in its ranks and quickly converted. Then the new crusade was preached. The crusade against the Iroquois, enemies of God and tools of the devil. The soldiers and the people were filled with a zeal half warlike and half religious. They are made to understand, writes Mother Mary, that this is a holy war, all for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. The fathers are doing wonders in inspiring them with true sentiments of piety and devotion. Fully five hundred soldiers have taken the scapulary of the Holy Virgin. It is we, the Ursulines, who make them. It is a real pleasure to do such work, and she proceeds to relate a bow miracle by which God made known his satisfaction at the fervor of his military servants. The secular motives for the war were in themselves strong enough, for the growth of the colony absolutely demanded the cessation of Iroquois raids and the French had begun to learn the lesson that in the case of hostile Indians no good can come of attempts to conciliate unless respect is first imposed by a sufficient castigation. It is true that the writers of the time paint Iroquois hostilities in their worst colours. In the innumerable letters which Mother Mary of the Incarnation sent home every autumn by the returning ships, she spared no means to gain the sympathy and aid of the devout, and with similar motives the Jesuits in their printed relations took care to extenuate nothing of the miseries which the pious colony endured. Avogor too, in urging the sending out of a strong force to fortify and hold the country, had advised that, in order to furnish a pretext and disarm the jealousy of the English and Dutch, exaggerated accounts should be given of danger from the side of the Confederates. Yet with every allowance, these dangers and sufferings were sufficiently great. The three upper nations of the Iroquois were comparatively pacific, but the two lower nations, the Mohawks and the Oneidas, were persistently hostile, making inroads into the colony by way of Lake Champlain and the Richelieu, murdering and scalping, and then vanishing like ghosts. Tracy's first step was to send a strong detachment to the Richelieu to build a picket fort below the rapids of Chambly, which take their name from that of the officer in command. An officer named Sorel soon afterwards built a second fort on the site of the abandoned palisade work built by Montmagny at the mouth of the river where the town of Sorel now stands. And Salieres, colonel of the regiment, added a third fort, two or three leagues above Chambly. These forts could not wholly bar the passage against the nimble and wily warriors who might pass them in the night, shouldering their canoes through the woods. A blow, direct and hard, was needed, and Tracy prepared to strike it. Late in the season, an embassy from the three upper nations 
the Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas arrived at Quebec, led by Garaconti, a famous chief whom the Jesuits had won over, and who proved ever after a staunch friend of the French. They brought back Charles Le Moyne of Montreal, whom they had captured some three months before, and now restored as a peace offering, taking credit to themselves that not even one of his nails had been torn out, nor any part of his body burnt. Garaconti made a peace speech, which, as rendered by the Jesuits, was an admirable specimen of Iroquois eloquence. But while joining hands with him and his companions, the French still urged on their preparations to chastise the contumacious Mohawks. The Iroquois, who were suffering an epidemic of smallpox, had their first glimpse of the new military strength of the French. The chiefs of the five nations decided to sign a peace treaty rather than fight them. The Iroquois Confederacy continued to hinder the thrust of Europeans into the West, but it was not about to destroy New France. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 